Hi folks, thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone, good evening. Hi folks who are just joining us. Hope you're sitting comfortably. Thank you for joining. We'll just give it another few seconds to let people come on in. Hello everyone, welcome. Hello, hello. Got a few familiar names here. Thanks for joining us everyone. Great, okay, well, we'll make a start and I hope you're all sitting comfortably with a, a glass of wine or some nibbles. Well, good evening folks and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's Marketing Manager and also joining me from the office team this evening is our General Manager, Andy Tucker. And we've been really busy in the office this last week or so as travel has really started to pick back up again, uh, which is very welcome, of course. And we're really pleased to resume these evening presentations. We started off last week with our travel Q&A and also talking about our sustainable tourism initiatives. And tonight we're taking you to some of our favorite regions in Western Europe. We operate well over a hundred different tours to Europe and we're really well established there. It's our bread and butter product. And we're still partnered with many family run lodges and hotels that we first partnered with over 30 years ago. And tonight is actually just one of five presentation evenings in which we'll highlight some of our tours there. And transporting us away to these lovely warm destinations this evening are, are four of our wonderful expert tour leaders, Jessica, David, Paul and Mike, who are joining us from various locations across the UK and are looking forward to treating us to some wildlife highlights this evening. Now, just a reminder, folks, you can pop your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, be this questions about requirements for travel overseas or specific questions about particular species that have been referenced during the presentations. We're really happy to answer these. We want these sessions to be interactive. So we'll try and type responses to you throughout the evening. And we'll also take questions at the end where we've allocated some time for discussion. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jessica, who's going to start our evening by taking us to Italy. Over to you, Jessica. Good evening, everybody. And I'm starting off by talking about the Dolomites, which is one of my favorite parts of Italy. It's a really lovely mountain range. And we currently offer three different trips there. The June one is mainly looking at wildflowers. The July is mainly butterflies and moths. And then a new one that we've run once so far in late September, early October is autumn in the Dolomites. And the July one and um, co-leading on the um, autumn one is my colleague, Luca Boscain, who lives over near Venice in Veneto always has a wonderful smile. So on these trips, we fly in to Venice Airport and we travel up across the Venice Plain to the mountains of the Dolomites in Northeast Italy. And coming in from the Southeast through Belluno, we usually manage a low level stop for natural history and or ice cream, usually both. And we stay in the Val de Fassa, which is this valley, which is bordered on the north and side by the Sella and Pordoi passes, and down on the south by the, the Rolla Pass. We're based in Tamion, which is more or less at the point of that red arrow. And these are the destinations that we go to uh, with the butterfly trip. And in the autumn, we'll usually do a low level visit down to the Bolzano region over there for the flowers we tend to stay higher. Where we stay is a lovely family run hotel called the Grand Mougon in this little hamlet of Tamion. And as you can see, it nestles between hay meadows and forests. And that's the Grand Mougon behind the mountain peak, which gives the hotel its name. And they have excellent food there. They have a Michelin starred restaurant attached to the hotel. Um, and we have similar fare, so it's always extremely good food. The hay meadows in summer are an absolute delight. They're usually on the point of cutting the hay around the hotel, but there's always some to find. 
and depending on the season we go slightly higher or lower but there's always lots of yellow rattle and you get these bright spots of orange lilies and clustered bellflowers and rampions and um, plantains and here are some of the other highlights you've got um, a yellow lousework particularis elongata doesn't really have an English name I'm afraid uh, bearded bellflower there with its hairy lips, dark columbine, Aquilegia atrata, and an orchid, round-headed orchid or globe orchid, um, Tronsteiner globosa. Also in the hay meadows, we may come across some Bruno's lily and lots of fragrant orchids, which have a wonderful scent. And as you can see, lots of clover and other things growing there in the meadows as well. So they're an absolute delight. Where it's a little bit more shady under the trees, then we find things like um, lesser butterfly orchid, fly orchid, and the diminutive little coral root orchid, or things to drool over. But particularly one of our favorites in the area is this fantastic patch of lady slipper orchids um, that we always take great pleasure in. Not always the easiest place to get to, as you can see, they're on a bank, but people have a wonderful way of managing to get up and down the bank to find them. And we often find another clump on a flatter surface for those who need that. One of my favorite flowers of woodland and more shady places on acid soils is the yellow wood violet, delicate little thing. And on the acid soils, you also find alpen rose, uh, rhododendron ferrugineum. And there's a relation of that called the hairy alpen rose, which grows on the, the limestone. And that's usually at its best when the butterfly trips there in July. It's only just coming out when we're there in June. Although none of the trips apart from the autumn one focus specifically on birds, we always enjoy the ones that are around. And this crested tip was taken in the autumn, but we often see them in the summer as well. Wonderful little birds. And we enjoy the butterflies on the plant trip. I mean, basically, we enjoy everything on all the trips. Um, Mazarine blues here and little blues. We're a bit early in June, though, for the best of the butterflies, which is why the butterfly trip runs slightly later. And this is a magnificent Titania's fritillary on a flower near the hotel, really beautiful. And you get the debilis form of marsh fritillary, often now called the alpine fritillary um, at higher altitudes and other species like alpine heath. Um, on the butterfly trip, there's a daily moth trap and sometimes in the autumn as well, if the weather permits and those who want to can come down and open it up before breakfast look at the various things that are around, including such species as older moth, great brocade, and to show that small can be beautiful, a micro moth, Hypercalia citronalis. And we also look at day flying moths such as these transparent burnets. But this one was this wonderful Apollo appeared during the flower trip in June, very, very fresh and sat very happily to be photographed. In June, you get the vanilla orchids just coming out. And these are in the Valvanegia towards the south of our area. You've got the dark vanilla orchid and the Austrian vanilla orchid. And you also have the red vanilla orchid, Gymnodenia miniata, uh, which has such a vibrant color, amazing color. And we're often accompanied by alpine chuffs at any time of the year keeping a beady eye on what we're doing. If you think of alpine flowers, you think of gentians, and this is Clusis's gentian on limestone with a little bit of shrubby milkwort down there as well in the background. And that's on alkaline, but on the acid soils, you've got trumpet gentian seen here with a lot of um, the yellow flowered form of alpine pask flower, which is highlighted here. And that's at Chiman de la Pala, which we call the Moody Mountain, um, down near the Roller Pass, towards the south of the Fassa Valley. 
also in that area we look for and enjoy um, Snowdon lily named after the mountain in um, North Wales, um, very small delicate little flower Gagea serotina and the primulas are fantastic there as well. You've got the long tube Haller's primrose, you've got primula auricula often called bear's ears, bright yellow and the near endemic primula minima least primrose and one of the true endemics of the area which we're just it's an early flower we sometimes see it sometimes we miss it is the Tyrolean primrose primula tyrolensis you find it in little rock crevices at high altitude also at high altitude there's the triglav gentian with its really sculptural leaves fantastic little flower and you get rock jasmines such as Androsaceae housemannii growing in these crevices. You never know quite what you will find in the rock crevices of the boulders at high altitude. Another one related to the Alpen rose is a dwarf Alpen rose, which again, so pretty. And in screes, limestone screes, you get the Raetian poppy, now part of the Alpine poppy complex with a bit of alpine toad flax there on the side. And one of my favorites is the King of the Alps. And there's the peak of Chimandilla Pala going up into the sky above. Another plant which is um, usually seen better by the summer people, the July people, but just coming into flower in June. And we actually found some still flowering very nicely in the autumn is the pink sankfoil, Potentilla nitida, one of the specials of the area. With the various butterflies, we've got alpine blue with its very distinctive underwings. Um, other specials, lesser mountain ringlet. There are lots of different ringlets. Some are commoner than others and some are easier to identify than others. But if you can get a good photo, you can usually work out what it is. You've got mountain clouded yellow, you've got peak white, all sorts of different species special to the altitudes. And um, on the butterfly trip, we make a point of noting the altitudes that we're finding the different species. Although not specifically looking at mammals, we always enjoy the marmots that are around. Um, we hear them whistling and often get good views of them. And sometimes some chamois uh, as well and mouflon. Snow finches we usually manage to get good views of, um, especially in the summer, and sometimes alpine accenture as well, though they're perhaps not quite as regular as the snow finches. In the autumn you can get all the seasons in a day, but in fact this photo was taken in June a few years ago where Snow is very unusual, but it can occur um, even in high summer. But we did have some snow in the autumn, but it didn't last and soon the sun was melting it. Um, so you get all sorts of weathers, but usually nice and warm in the summer, but you can get afternoon thunderstorms and it's always quite a challenge to get the, the picnic sorted before a thunderstorm comes. Usually a bit more settled in July weather-wise. One of the nice things about the Dolomites is that up every valley, there'll be a little refugio selling hot chocolate to die for, um, or coffees and things. And they're usually a little bit more easily accessible than that one up there, although it has to be said, there is a path that goes up the back um, that's not quite as steep as you might think. Going down to lower levels, then, we enjoy butterflies such as the marble fritillary and checkered blue, Meliagas blue, purple emperor, white admiral, um, different species we see where it's a bit warmer down lower levels. And in the autumn, we had amazing views of golden eagles, saw so lots of golden eagles, and you sometimes see them in the summer as well, but not quite as, as many as we saw in the autumn. Fantastic view, views of crossbills um feeding as well and in the autumn the red deer are starting to rut you can hear the roar of the stags 
and we went out one evening to, to look and listen. Flowers, there are some that specifically flower in the autumn, such as this colchicum, autumn crocus, and there were a surprising number of um, spring and summer flowers either hanging on or having a second flowering. So we've had some interesting flowers as well in the autumn, as well as the beginning of fantastic autumn colors. But the highlight of the um, autumn trip, I think, was this melanistic adder, um, which we, we were able to find and enjoy and was well photographed by everyone. And this photograph from my colleague Luca here. So that's a very brief introduction to some of the wonders of this fantastic part of the world. Um, wonderful mountains, glorious light, fantastic wildlife, um, something in every season. And I hope that you've enjoyed those and that I recommend the area to you if you don't already know it. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Jessica. David, over to you. Thanks, um, David Morris. Um, yeah, tonight I'm going to be talking to you uh, about the French Pyrenees, um, a place I've led for Nature Trek for a number of years <clears throat> uh, on, the, on the French side of the Pyrenees. I mean, led both French and Spanish side of the Pyrenees uh, for Nature Trek. There's, there's definitely a difference that you can tell uh, climatically, geologically, and within the wildlife as well. The French side on that northern face tends to be a bit, bit moister climate, um, has a different range of species um, at a different stage um, at that time of year. Uh, traditionally, um, go in uh, June, um, and next year, certainly, Nature Trek is planning on uh, booking out the hotel as part of the uh, Wildlife Festival in the French Pyrenees. Um, it's one of the oldest trips that Nature Trek have, have done, um, going back to the early 90s um, and uh, still staying at the same hotel. Bear with me. So we fl fly down into uh, Lourdes um, or occasionally into Pau. Um, and then from there, it's a short journey south into the Parc National de Pyrenees. Um, for most of the trip, we spend our entire trip in the sort of Jedra Gavani area. Uh, this area on the uh, the north face of uh, the northern side of the uh, the French, uh, just the French border. Um, it's characterised by big cirques and big limestone cliffs to the south of the area, and then this bowl with a kind of range of peaks and valleys. Uh, with a mix of meadows and woodlands and uh, alpine turf. Um, some of the, the areas that we stay, I've marked on the map. So we stay in Jedra, um, which is just over 1,100 metres. We explore places like the Hias Valley, uh, the Cirque de Gavani up above Gavani village, uh, the Port de Bouchereau, um, on the Spanish border, a road that went over to Spain that was never completed by the Spaniards into the Spanish side, um, and then up into the Osu, and places like the Plateau de Sorgue um, and the, the Cirque above Givani. Um, our hotel for the week um, is the Hotel Brescia Roland. So this is a, the same hotel that um, Nature Trek have stayed at for 30 odd years. Uh, fantastic location to base ourselves, uh, great cooking, great accommodation quality. And I think the thing that uh, my clients always blown away when I go is the promise of um, uh, good wildlife from the site. Gets its name from the Breche de Roland, this gap up on the cliffs um, in the distance on the French-Spanish uh, border. Um, and as I say, my clients are always amused by the fact that we fly into um, Lourdes and I promise them the three o'clock Lamagaya at the hotel. And uh, generally without fail, when we pull into the hotel to unload our bags and uh, settle into our rooms, sure enough, we usually see birds like Lamagaya circling over the hotel. And actually they roost on the cliffs opposite the hotel, along with griffin vultures, the smaller birds in the background. 
I think the French Pyrenees is a brilliant place for the general naturalist, uh, but also birders, botanists, entomologists. The landscape is so diverse. Um, it's a high altitude area in, in Europe, um, a diverse range of species, rich meadows, woodlands, alpine turf, as I say, not dissimilar to the place, uh, to some of the places that Jessica described. It's mostly on limestone, the area go with some areas um, of acidic rock underlying and intrusions, which alter the geology and the, the botany particularly. Um, we quickly start botanizing around the hotel and some of those areas, looking for some of the bird life in there, getting ourselves used to some of the sort of species that um, are within, the, within that district. Um, endemism is, is one of the kind of key things of this trip as well. Many of the plants and some of the mammals and invertebrates particularly are endemic to the Pyrenees. Um, here we've got things like horned pansy and this delightful uh, pea, which are both endemic to the Pyrenees. Um, orchid enthusiasts won't be disappointed as well. Um, a range of sort of uh, more familiar European orchids, things like elderflower orchid in the middle, which has a, a sort of creamy yellow and a purple form, burnt orchid, uh, tway blades. These adorn some of the kind of turfs and meadows within the area. And butterflies as well are, are really well represented. And I'm in mean, a trip here in June is sort of 60 to 70 species. Um, we tend to average on the trips um, and just seeing butterflies in really uh, sort of overwhelming numbers, which we're just not accustomed to in the UK. Um, range of species, many of which are specialists of sort of montane environments, some endemic. There's a Gavani blue, which I, I must confess I've never seen, but uh, certainly on some of the later trips that Pyrenees people have seen it. Uh, but, but places like this on dunging sites and salt licks and that, you often get clouds of butterflies, like things like Adonis blue, little blue, some of the, the skippers, heath fritillaries. Um, it's, it, it's truly wonderful. Also good for, um, for herb tiles for anyone who's interested in that. And um, this is a uh, European asp viper. This is our most um, potent native snake to Europe. Um, surprisingly see a, a good number of these snakes, uh, thankfully generally warming up in the morning within uh, dry stone walls, particularly on the walk out of Gavani. And uh, often a surprise to see this was one coiled up and posing for a photo a couple of years back. And then the bird is uh, uh, generally not dissatisfied on the trip as well. Um, I mean, who, who wouldn't uh, want to see sort of the annual, uh, the daily morning lamagaya and kind of griffin vultures at eye level and a good range of sort of uh, passerines that are kind of common in the European mountains around the sort of hotel range, as well as some of those much higher altitude birds that are uh, quite special and sought out on the trip. But yeah, it, it's, it's the landscape that's there to be appreciated. This, this was a particularly late spring um, on the Plateau de Sorgue, just above the hotel, um, and meadows, early meadows that at normal times are, are much more advanced than this, but at, at this time, particular uh, June when we did the trip was just an absolute sea of uh, Guan's buttercup, uh, an endemic buttercup, along with um, big, chunky Narcissus bicolor uh, daffodils. Uh, grow wild in the meadows and we soon learn about some of the agricultural systems in the area that create these uh, sort of manage some of these habitats so they process a transhumance where people bring their livestock down from the lowlands in France and um, we usually get uh, sort of herds of livestock with their bells clanking up through the, uh, the village past the hotel when we're staying there um, for the shepherds to bring them up and uh, live with the livestock in these huts um, up in the summer months the hotel for it is just actually sat nestled below those uh, that evening cloud just in the valley bottom there. Um, and this these this place is a really great area of sort of high altitude hay meadows with great butterfly and great plants and great birds. Um, you can see Jedra and the hotel nestled down there in the bottom of the Hias Valley. A um, bit of time exploring some of the woodlands and sort of the scrubby montane uh, scrub in the area for a range of species. Um, the sort of spring snow melts and uh, warming up starts to bring out some of those sort of woodland jewels, things like uh, hepatica, hepatica nobilis, um, a variety of different flower and leaf, um, uh, flower and leaf colour forms uh, that we often find here. Um, and the endemic uh, Ramonda myconi, uh, limited number of the species of these in Europe in the Gisneriaceae uh, family, uh, really fantastic plant that you often find in sort of shady rock crevices. Um, endemic to the Pyrenees 
found on both the French and the Spanish side. And butterflies in these sort of woodland edges. So um, in this particular area, Apollo and clouded Apollo, we find tend to be butterflies that are in sort of woodland clearings and meadows around uh, some of the woodlands. And, and pretty much every trip we, we find um, Apollos, getting some great views of this really chunky sort of paper wing butterfly. Um, as a, as a woodland, e woodland edge plants as well, some sought after endemics here. We've got uh, Lillian Pyrenaicum, uh, fantastic um, endemic Turk's cap uh, lily. I'm not sure whether your screens can see it or not, but uh, quite in the Shire, Cyrus latifolia. Some areas in the Pyrenees can get absolute hillsides full of this uh, stunning plant, which I, I always find looks quite out of context growing in that landscape. Um, particularly on the acidic areas growing in amongst the rhododendrons that Jessica talked about is um, the white form of uh, the alpine passflower, uh, passflower uh, subspecies alpina, uh, fantastic um, uh, passflower for that area. And this is the sort of landscape you find that in. This is the Cirque de Gavani, so um, check our uh, famous nature trek picnics with us, um, carry them out on a, on a lovely walk up in, into a valley or into a cirque to explore the valley and it's Okay, folks, I don't think David has got a very good internet connection because I can't hear him anymore. He's frozen on my screen. So hopefully he'll come back to us in just a second. He's left us with a very lovely picture of the Cirque de Gavani, but he has completely frozen. And hopefully he'll be back in... A second. Oh no, he's gone completely. He's gone completely. Righty ho, give us a second. There we go. Oh no, he's joining us back again. David, hi. You're on mute at the moment. <laughs> but we lost you for a second. You left us with a lovely picture. Of a waterfall, I hope. No, Cirque du Gavani, nice scenic. We're not seeing it yet. Just bear with us, folks. Sorry about this. Just one of those things. Can't see it yet, no. And I can't see a picture of you either anymore, actually. I'll tell you what, Sarah, while, while you um, maybe give David a call on his mobile and um, hopefully restore his connection, he, he might be able to go out and back in again. I'll just talk folks through the logistics of these two tours, if that's an idea, for a couple of minutes. Yeah, either that or we could ask one of the speakers to, to dive in. If you're happy to do that, Andy, then uh, I'll give David a ring. Sorry about this, folks. Yeah, we'll fine. Be... Sorry, yeah. this is one of the downsides, folks, of uh, doing these online. But never mind, we'll get David back with us uh, shortly, I hope. Um, but I'll just take a couple of minutes because Jessica was quite quick through her talk. So we've got a few minutes spare just while we get David back. I'll talk you through the logistics of these two tours. So first of all, the Dolomites, we fly into uh, Venice with British Airways or EasyJet generally. And a lot of participants actually like to do an extension in Venice, do a bit of culture either before or after the tour. And uh, that's easily arranged, flights daily into Venice. That's a really nice a week-long tour that I've stayed at a hotel myself in the winter and the summer. I've been skiing there in the winter. If any of you like to ski, I can thoroughly recommend the Val de Fassa as a winter ski destination. And, and Jessica brought all of those lovely flowers to life, which we enjoy in the summer months. Uh, for the tour that David's talking about, fantastic scenery up there, David. I mean, it's one of my favourite places in Europe. Um, we fly with a much maligned uh, Ryanair into Lourdes, as uh, David mentioned. Um, 
I have to say, Ryan, that's not my favourite carrier. But having said that, in over the years, I've flown with them on countless occasions and I've never been delayed and uh, they've never lost my baggage. So they have got some plus points. But the major plus point I find uh, with Ryanair is they fly direct into some wonderful wildlife destinations. So I'm thinking um, Santander in north of Spain, Lourdes in France. And from Lourdes up to the hotel, it's only an hour and a quarter. And the alternative would be to fly into Toulouse. And then you've got a four hour traipse on the French motorways before you, you get into the mountains. So there's always uh, pros and cons of, of these flight choices. And we don't tend to use Ryanair uh, unless there's a, a choice or, or, there's a, or the airport's particularly close to our base. Um, so yeah, that's how we get to these doors. Uh, looks like Dave is back with us. So uh, are you happy to dive back in, David, and, and take us back to where we dropped yeah. off? Sorry about that. I have no idea what on earth happened with that, but uh, we'll get you back on. Um, I think I left you at the Cirque de Gavani. Yeah, so I think I, I left you at the Cirque de Gavani before uh, the internet crashed or whatever happened. Um, I was just saying this is a sort of typical destination for one of our day trips out from the hotel, a short minibus drive, and then we tend to take our sort of famous nature trek picnic for uh, a wander out into uh, into these landscapes. Great, great bit of habitat there. Uh, black woodpeckers in the woodland, rock buntings um, in the scrub, a range of orchids and gentians in the foreground, plenty of butterflies. And that scenery, which is, I, I agree with what Andy says, it's probably one of my favourite trips that I've done for an age track over the years, having done it several times. Um, we tend to walk into the cirque itself and have our picnic lunch under uh, La Grande Cascade, which is um, France's uh, largest waterfall at 460 odd metres in, in height um, and, and just dwarfed against those sort of thousand metre limestone cliffs in the back of the cirque um, in the vague hope of seeing wall creepers and things like that clinging on. Um, no picnic is uh, to be enjoyed without being gate crashed by alpine chuffs. So uh, exceptional views of alpine chuffs as you eat your picnic. Um, and yeah, more places like this. So this is the um, uh, Cirque du Store Bay, uh, just up above the hotel. Um, a typical kind of walk out in the day from the, uh, from the hotel um, so through some really interesting limestone scenery. Um, yep, the turf is absolutely studded with blue, um, so on the sort of alkaline limestone conditions, plenty of Gentiana acaulis, Gentiana verna, and then on the acidic areas, particularly up in the Cirque de Tremus, we find uh, Gentiana alpina on the right, which we, we often identify some of these by the sort of shapes of the calyx at the base of the, the flowers, as well as the, the sort of habitat they're growing in. Uh, more endemism here, so uh, Pyrenean buttercup often grows on the acidic turfs in these, these cirques. Um, and then a, a sought after uh, Pyrenean endemic bulb here. This is uh, Fritillaria pyreniaca, a bit like uh, snake's heads that we're used to, uh, but with a sort of chocolate brown bell and inside a sort of yellow and brown uh, checkerboard effect. Um, this is hairy primula, primula hirsuta, and tell about the sort of slightly hairy leaves, um, along with uh, what looks like um, a crusted sax, sax paniculata there. Um, so we're starting to get into that sort of alpine zone, and um, I think that's what, what I particularly enjoy about this trip, is being up in the, in the sort of alpine zone with some of those um, classic alpine plants, alpine birds, butterflies. Um, and alpine birds don't come any better than uh, rock thrush. This is uh, rock thrush, the proper rock thrush, uh, rufous belly rock thrush. Um, often find these jumping about on the boulders um, up in the tops of these cirques, sometimes feeding feeding young, like we sometimes see uh, ring oozles in this country. Um, and the botanical pedants amongst us here will probably spot that that actually is, uh, is not a bit of uh, limestone from the... Uh, uh, Pyrenees, that's actually in Kazakhstan, but um, yes, I need a picture of rock thrush there. Um, and as I say, if you've not had enough of uh, lamagaias from the hotel, um, you're always in for a lamagaia on a walk. And uh, this was um, not the best photo of mine, but a um, uh, photo of actually dropping um, a leg of a, a goat or a sheep or something, doing that sort of bone breaking. And I remember a few years ago, um, me and DT found a, a dead sheep 
trapped under some snow in a river and I hauled it out onto the bank, continued on our walk up the valley, only to come back down the valley later on to find Lammergeier and uh, a number of griffin vultures down on the carcass, giving us some unbelievable views. Um, it's not just butterflies in the interesting invertebrates. So these are uh, sulfur winged owl flies. Uh, huge numbers of these emerging. They're an ant lion relative, which um, many clients on the trip are often fascinated by these really beautiful beasts. I think lace wing relative. Alpine marmots adorn the turf, um, nibbling away on the turf and then whistling when a sort of griffin vulture or a lama guy comes down, usually a good early warning system for lama guys approaching. But the turf that they're running around in, really fragrant and pungent at that time of year with things like Daphne Neorum, this lovely prostrate little Daphne, heavenly scent of growing in the turf in that area. Uh, we have the, the sort of Narcissus bicol, the big bulky uh, daffodils growing up in the, in the meadows. This is um, Narcissus asoanus, a rush-leaf jonquil, really small, dainty little uh, alpine uh, rockery sort of daffodil uh, growing along with um, the sort of blue heads of uh, a mat of globularia uh, nudicorlis, uh, which I thought was particularly photogenic. Um, Carnivorous plants, again, I mean, not a group of plants that people necessarily go to the uh, Pyrenees to see, but um, yeah, being the good old Pyrenees, we've got uh, an endemic there. So we've got Pinguicula, Pinguicula longifolia, um, an endemic butterwort on the right that's got these sort of sticky leaves and um, traps invertebrates and uh, to uh, get nutrition, this grain on limestone. But we also get uh, Pinguicula grandiflora, largely the vulgaris, which we get in this country, along with the diminutive little alpina with the white flowers top left. Uh, snow finches, um, a bird classically encountered in the backs of these cirques as we uh, uh, bounce about over boulders and look in some of the snow fields um, to find them. And once you get up uh, to a good altitude, you get a good, good view, uh, things like Moss Campion in the foreground, Silenia Corlis, and that's looking south at the Port de Bouchereau over the Spanish Pyrenees and noticeably um, less green and uh, drier, more arid looking, even from looking over on the, on the French side. And yeah, there's a trip that you can, uh, you can visit two countries in a day as we uh, jaunt over the, uh, the Spanish border as well. Um, some of the uh, saxifrages um, people often want to go and look at. Uh, the particular one of interest in the Pyrenees is uh, top right saxifraga longifolia. Um, this is a big dinner plate um, sized rosettes of this grow on the limestone. Uh, it's actually a monocarpic plant, so it produces these great big white flowered flower spikes in profusion in some years, flowers its socks off and sets a load of seed and then dies. And these are all um, these two on the right, paniculata and longifolia, the sort of silver and crusted saxifrages that we find plenty of. And then uh, some of the mossy saxifrages, such as uh, musky saxifrage on the top there, um, commonly encountered on the trip. Um, they say uh, another endemic here to the Pyrenees, this is uh, an endemic little uh, creeping globularia. Uh, globularia repens, creeps over, over limestone rock with these lovely um, sort of bluey, uh, uh, bluey lilac flowers. And then the one that's, um, I usually build this one up for a trip up to see uh, the Pyrenean yam. Um, I know, um, having, having taken people before, and I was like, what's the highlight? Well, it's got to be this, the endemic Pyrenean yam, which uh, it's definitely, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, its endemic status makes it particularly exciting. Um, it's not the most floriferous of plants, but certainly a green flower thing is a connoisseur's plant, and it grows in the limestone rubble and screens up above the Cirque de Gavani. Um, well worth going to have a look at. Um, but while you're up there, you can usually find some good birds as well. So things like Alpine Centre, uh, hopping about and jumping about on the rock and the keen-eyed botanists among sure I'm sure have spotted that purple uh, mountain saxifrage in the background there. Um, some really fantastic bits of wetland habitat. Uh, this is the Osu Valley. Um, one year we didn't actually even get up there because the landslip in the in the in the distance had blocked the road with uh, so much snow um, that we we just couldn't pass. But um, yeah, a short drive up there, parked near the barrage, and and fantastic bit of turf full of um, things like Primula farinosa growing in there. Uh, looking the other way up the valley to some spectacular peaks up towards the Spanish border. 
uh, the, the sort of blue glacial meltwaters of the Barrage d'Arsou, and uh, a fertile around in some of these cold alpine uh, streams and pools. We'll find things like Pyrenean brook newt, uh, an endemic newt. This is male and the brighter coloured, smaller male in the foreground with a really orange belly. I've done the trip a number of times now, and I think the thing that I find a joy with this area is just depends on the season what you see. And uh, no two trips are ever the same. This is the Cirque de Tremouse um, up above Gavani, and it's mostly acidic cirque with limestone backs. Um, and this is one June, and then the June later, it can be covered in snow with a totally different flora and uh, bird life and butterfly life. So I think that's one of the reasons I love this place. It always keeps me on my toes, different things to see year in, year out. But whatever you do, I don't think you'll be, uh, you'll miss out on some incredible uh, botanical delights, birds and butterflies in uh, the French Pyrenees. And uh, yeah, I'll leave you there with uh, a particularly late spring with alpine snow bills bursting through the, the, uh, the late snows. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was absolutely fantastic. Some stunning scenery there and, and photographs from both you and Jessica. Uh, really much, very much enjoyed that. Um, we finished a couple of minutes early before our breaks. So we do have time for any questions. If anyone would like to uh, pop a question either into the chat or into the, the Q&A section. And just while we're waiting for any questions to, to come on in, Andy, you were kind of cut off while David uh, then came back in, but you were sort of mid-flow talking about uh, this region, which you know very well. Is there anything further you wanted to add? Yeah, I think I'm pretty much covered what I wanted to say logistically, but as David said, this is one of our longest standing tours. It was actually back in the summer of 1991 that our founders, David and Marianne Mills, wrecked this tour because a fledgling nature trek was cut short by the Gulf War that year in 1991. And suddenly in the Middle East, uh, they had an, an Asia, the mountains of Nepal and Bhutan, etc. They had no business, so they had to uh, reset their sites and look for a, a safer destination close to home. So that's what took the mills up into the Pyrenees in uh, summer 1991. And uh, as David alluded to there, the rest is history. Uh, great memories of my trip there, David, in 2016, when we did our 30th anniversary trip. And we, as you said, we're taking over the whole hotel uh, again next year, next June. Um, and Keith Roylands, this is a really common question, how much walking is involved the distance and severity and what, what I'd say there is um, generally it, it's a tour that suits the keener walker there's some fantastic walks but when we take over the whole hotel with five leaders we split up don't we so you've got a, a cohort of really keen walkers that want to get a lot of miles under their belts and do some quite serious mountain walking and at the other end of the spectrum you've got a minibus load who just want to potter with everything in between keen birders and keen botanists so um, uh, the festival concept works really well there. I think you you back me up on that one, David. Yeah, I would, and I think, but I think even on the sort of general tour as well. I mean, yes, it's a it's a kind of grade B, so there's a bit more walking involved. But I've I've had clients kind of um, we often go one way and come back the same way so often we'll have clients all slow down around lunchtime and then we'll gather them back up on the way back down the valley or for particularly younger or kind of more um, adventurous ones often there's another ridge which I'll often happily go up to if they want a bit more exercise or or likewise I mean the hotel is in such a spectacular place with an abundance of wildlife around it even the odd sort of more relaxed day off around the hotel will yield their uh, clients a um, really good range of things but but yeah when you've got the 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 advantage of multiple leaders and vehicles it's even better it's similar in the dolomites because you've got the refugios where you know people can always retreat for a coffee or a chocolate or something um while they're waiting for groups to come back again and again most of our walks are out and back there they tend to be a steady pace as well i mean if you if you go on any walk with particularly with botanists and um they, te they tend not to be a route march particularly yeah. uh, but ev even on on those trips where we often have a botanist and a birding leader as well it often allows groups to go at slightly different paces particularly if there's a desire for for that sort of thing but generally i try to make those trips I do inclusive for all I'm, I'm smiling at this question from william wraith here what health checks required moving between France and Spain. Now, William, we can either 
look into the legislation and, and current travel advice if you think about driving between France and Spain. But what you're talking about there, David, is literally a few steps across a mountainous border without a, an officer or a paper pusher in sight, aren't you? Absolutely. Yeah, there's no, not even a Spanish presence there because the Spanish didn't keep up their bargain and uh, build the road in. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, no worries there at all. Yeah, it's a country tick for anyone who wants to stick a boot in the other side of the border. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks very much, folks. OK, everyone, we'll go to a quick break now, just 10 minutes. So we'll be back at 25 past eight. You've got 10 minutes just to go and pop the kettle on, top up your tea or glass of wine, uh, nip to the loo, get some more nibbles. So we'll be back here in just under 10 minutes time. See you shortly.
Okay, welcome back folks. I think we've had some questions answered during the uh, the interval there. Any more questions, we'll take those uh, at the end of the talks at 9.05, but for now we'll hand straight over to Paul. After you, Paul. Okay. Okay. Is that okay, Sarah? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about part of France called the Vercors. I have often had the question that immediately comes back to me is, where is the Vercors? The Vercors is in southeast France, in the um, region of Grenoble which you see here in the top right hand corner. Um, and if you follow the roads coming in from the left up towards the top, down to Grenoble and then back down south, that follows the route of the Isère River. And the lump in the middle where La Chapelle and Vercors is, is a plateau, which is the Vercors region of France. If you put the Vercors into the search engine, to a search engine, you invariably get two responses. One is German orchid sites um, where they discuss orchids. And the other is the Second World War, um, the resistance, uh, the French resistance in the Second World War, which was an extremely sad story, but, um, um, but it's something that you will encounter when you go there. There are lots of memorials. and We explain a bit more about it. We've been going to the Vercors now. We, this will be our 20th year. Uh, I first went there in 2003 with Andy Tucker uh, to lead the first ever meet, uh, trip there. And I've led everyone since that's been, been there. Um, <clears throat> um, sorry, I somehow managed to turn my video off. I do apologize. Um, okay. Um, we fly into um, Lyon, um, which is north of Grenoble, and uh, we fly in with British Airways or with um, um, EasyJet, and it's about a two and a half hour, two hour on a good day run down to La Chapelle and Vercors. Once we get to Grenoble, you have to drive up on to the plateau and down down to where we where we stay. Hello, oh. There we go. Uh, La Chapelle and Vercors is our, um, our um, residence for the whole period in which we stay for the four trips that we lead there during the course of a year. I will explain more about those later, of all the different ones. Um, in La Chapelle is the hotel we stay at, which is the Hotel Bellier. Uh, we've stayed there every single year since we've been going. And um, it's, uh, we have seen it develop and we've got to know the family run by Fabienne Bellier and her three daughters. It is a matriarchy. Each of the three daughters has two daughters. Um, and uh, the only incomers are the, uh, the male partners. Um, so there are no male children within the family. So there's grandma, there's great grandma, and there are three daughters and six granddaughters. So it's quite a performance. However, they are very, very obliging, very, very helpful and extremely um, pleasant to be with. Their cooking is superb. The Vercors region um, has uh, a reputation for wonderful cheese and uh, cheeses are certainly on the menu every evening as the third of the four courses that you have for, for, for dinner to, um, to uh, choose from the selection. <clears throat> 
like your former the two formerly uh, talkers, uh, the um, the Verkor region is limestone, and um, we have a tendency to um, usually to begin with the uh, Fond d'Or, which is um, as you can see from this photograph, is a ski station in the winter time, and has spring and summer grazing in the um, uh, in the spring and the summer. It's also extremely rich. Um, there are good birds here, things like um, um, we get the, um, the uh, ring oozles and we get the um, um, water pipit and, and such birds. And we also get the, the ubiquitous uh, alpine chuff, which are my, the former two speakers also referred to. When the snow begins to melt in this part of the world, um, um, it is, uh, it's rather nice in May when you've got the dog tooth violets and the, uh, the early um, spring crocuses coming up uh, in huge, huge numbers, uh, along with uh, daffodils and uh, various sorts, including poeticus and pseudo narcissus, the one we get in the one we pseudo narcissus we get in the British Isles. Uh, poeticus uh, only ever occurs as a rarity in, in Britain. Um, but there are thousands upon thousands of the uh, the dog tooth violets as you can see here. Not a violet. Whoops, sorry, I've gone one too far. Uh, yellow whitlow grass on the um, on the crags, um, little lumpy uh, the little lumpy crags, along with saxifrages like paniculata, the livelong saxifrage, and the moshata again, the musky saxifrage, um, in in good numbers in the spring. Alpine snowbells, we can again, uh, like David, we can find these coming through the snow if there's late snow lying. Um, also, they are always one of the first to be there as soon as the snow is gone. Uh, and there's good numbers of these, along with things like Mazaria um, uh, as well. And um, they are all, always pretty and always attractive and uh, always of interest to any, anyone who's uh, into the alpine plants of the world. Elderflower orchids, we get both uh, flowering color forms, the yellow form and the purple form. Um, this is the photograph of a lot of the clients like to get the one with both, both in the same photograph. However, in this region, I can't speak for elsewhere, but in this region, the yellow one tends to be out slightly before the purple one. The purple one always seems to be a week behind but um, sometimes they are out together as they were in this, on this occasion. Uh, this is certainly a spring. In the summer, we get the, uh, the, the um, Gallica form of the uh, black vanilla orchid or Ostriaca bar Gallica, um, slightly more compact head uh, on a little tiny short stem about three inches tall, very attractive, very dark until it actually opens when it becomes more more, more reddish. Butterflies in this part of the world are, are, are good at, at, at all times. Uh, in the spring, things like Adonis blue, as we have here, um, and um, sooty copper are both very, very um, frequent. Um, in the summer trip, where we lead a butterfly and moth trip, you get um, we have as many as I think 110 species is our record, and we average 90 to 100 species of butterfly um, in the week that we spend there, looking at altitudes from 400 meters above sea level to 2000 meters above sea level. So getting a good uh, variation in habitat and at altitude. So we do get some, uh, a really good cross section of, of species. Another one of the region's um, uh, orchid, well-known orchid sites, is the Col de Bacchus. Um, the Vercor region is uh, certainly up there with the, uh, the Gargano Peninsula. Um, um, having led trips to both, the Gargano Peninsula has a lot more hybridization, which can prove tricky on occasions than you get uh, in, um, in, in the Vercor. The Col de Bacchus has 48 species of orchid across the season, which is quite a, that's quite a good number. Um, and we certainly get to see quite a few of the, uh, uh, of them while we're there. 
this particular one, the Drome Orchid, uh, Ophrys dromana, um, is uh, endemic to just two departements of France. And, um, and uh, we identify quite a few of them, a bit like a small version of um, uh, Ophrys bertoloniae with this kind of ski slope type. Uh, um, um, just let me um, go on to, oh, I was, sorry, I was trying to find the, sorry, trying to find the, the ski slope on the labellum which is almost right angled here. Um, uh, it's a bit like Bertoloni, but it's much, much smaller, much tinier. Lesser butterfly orchids, again, a British species, but there are quite a few of these. They tend to like roadsides or open meadows. Um, certainly um, where I know it in the British Isles, it's more on acidic soil, but certainly it's uh, quite happy on the, on the limestone, unless of course it leaches, which we, we can't know. Fly orchids, quite a lot of those. There's one bank we know with about 60 on it, which is quite attractive. Um, uh, bird's nest orchid, uh, saprophytic orchid that uh, likes dead plant material. And monkey orchid, again, orchis simia. Um, great numbers of these, um, not to be mistaken for military orchids, which we also get. Burnt tips. Uh, has been uh, we uh, got quite a good number of these uh, uh, now near Tinea rustilata, um, certainly in four or five locations that we we visit in the spring, and um, they uh, they're always refreshing to see and exciting for some people who who don't get them. In the south of England where I live, we do get some, but as you move north through the British Isles, they're much much more infrequent. Pale orchid or orchis palens is probably one of my favourites. Uh, absolutely no marks on the labellum at all. Very big, glossy green leaves and up to a foot tall with about four inches of inflorescence at the top. Absolutely stunning species when you see a lot of them. And uh, we do see quite a few of them in several locations within the Burkhor region. Lesser uh, late um, spider orchid. Um, it's gone through several name changes over the time. Um, I was uh, in a particular spot in the Verkor region uh, a few, uh, two years ago uh, with a group showing them a number of uh, different orchids in the place. And there was a chap wandering around looking at the same plants that we were looking at. And at one point he, he offered to show us um, uh, a, a particular species, um, which he gave a very strange name to. And I said, is that um, the local book that you use is by a guy called uh, Delforge. It's a fairly well-known book. And I said to the chap, is that one of Delforge's uh, choices of names? And he turned around and said, I am Monsieur Delforge, which was a little bit of a surprise, which a lot of people, <laughs> the group with me were quite taken with it. He was it's charming and extremely helpful. Um, although he does split his names up quite a lot, but um, there was a variation on this that he showed us, which is really kind of. Um, up onto the uh, <clears throat> above um, the um, village of Pont and Royan, uh, we we uh, we get up into the uh, the higher bits of the um, limestone. Here we've got some interesting roads that have been carved out the side of the mountains uh, back in Victorian times. Um, extreme, extremely good for some bird for some of the bird watching. Um, here we were watching um, house martins nesting on the cliff face, um, unlike uh, under the eaves of uh, houses that we have at home. Um, there were house martins here. We also had uh, crag martins nesting in holes in the um, in the in the cliffs, and there were. Um, uh, kestrels feeding young and calling to young over our head and also short-toed eagles were, um, were in this area as well um, so some some uh, quite good bird watching for the uh, for the bird watchers amongst us uh, this little fella is uh, infrequent uh, they are in this area they're very they are quite a lot of them in this area but 
as many birders will know, extremely difficult to see. We've been fortunate over the years with a local guy in the area who's been able to um, tell us where there might be a nest. And we've been able to stake the nest out. And sometimes we've seen them um, carrying uh, yolk sacks away and then taking food to and fro to the female. Um, um, and this is the case with this particular photograph that was taken in that particular um, scenario uh, coming to and from the nest to feed the female. Woodlarks down at the lower altitude. Um, woodlarks are, um, are quite uh, um, frequent. Um, not so much at the higher altitude, but on the woodland margins lower down, um, they are, there are quite a few that we do get, along with redback shrike uh, as well, which are not so common higher up. Short-toed eagles, <coughs> excuse me, uh, short-toed eagles are not infrequent at all. We do get quite a few of these and um, often pairs as well uh, nesting in the area. Griffon vultures, um, there's some very large colonies of griffon vultures in this area, all of which that are, um, are monitored and um, supplementary fed. Uh, they are far, far bigger colonies than they would normally be um, uh, under normal circumstances. So there can be upwards of 40, 50 pairs sometimes uh, in some of these uh, roosts. Um, they do tend to um, move around, they're a bit migratory, they, they, and I say migratory, um, they, they move from one set of rocks to another and over the years that we've been going there, we now are at their fourth location since we first started going to, um, to the Verkor. So uh, but we do try to keep up with them. Lauergeiers are much less frequent, unlike where David's been. Um, there was an introduction um, to part of um, the uh, Vercors on the uh, east side at the um, uh, Cirque d'Archen. Um, we were on the west side one day when an adult male flew up, the, uh, drifted up the, low, up the ridge we were taking a picnic below. And I immediately phoned the chap who I know in the region and said, when's your release going ahead? And he said, next Sunday. So it would appear that this one was a true vega, a true one passing through. And actually he went out of his house from where he lived further north of us and picked up the same bird about 10 minutes later as it flew past where he lives. So um, that, that was quite exciting. The release that took place in the Cirque de Achien was um, uh, one female and two males, and they are all three of them still there. Um, they were picked up on one occasion when I was in there three years ago um, by Laura Benito. She spotted uh, one of the adults. We're not sure which one, but we certainly saw one of the adults because they were they were sub-adult when they were first released. Um, but uh, that was quite fortunate. The highest point on the Vercor Plateau is Le Grand Vaimont and is situated above what is known as La Haute Plateau. The Haute Plateau is the higher plateau with on, um, actually on the plateau itself. The plateau of the Vercor has another plateau, which we drive up to. Um, the birders have the option to go up here early in the morning, setting off from the hotel at half past three, after they've given us breakfast if we want it. And um, you get up to the, to, to the top here in time to walk the one and three quarter kilometers up to the top of the plateau and out to a black grouse lek in time for first light. Um, you can hear them bubbling away as you walk out. Um, but uh, um, one of the interesting things with the black grouse in this part of the world is many of them lek from the top of a tree. Uh, some still dance on the ground. And in May, when we're getting there, it's mainly the uh, unattached males that we are seeing still performing, still trying to attract females. Uh, this is Laura Benito's photograph of a male on top of a tree, um, bubbling away, hoping to attract a female. Uh, we do see the occasional female, but it's usually the males that we see um, because the females are all usually attached by this time. There are also um, Dunnock, and um, um, citral finch uh, up on the plateau here uh, and 
Golden Eagle is, has been seen while we've been up there uh, as well. <clears throat> uh, the Lady Slipper Orchid seems to be popular with a lot of people. Um, this isn't quite as big a colony as um, the one that Jessica referred to, um, but this is, uh, this is quite a good colony. It's a little bit of a drive to get to it um, because it's uh, on the other side of the, uh, the Vercor Plateau, but worth it from uh, a lot of points of view. One is it, it's located near a subalpine meadow which is very, very rich for butterflies and other insects and day flying moths. Um, we've actually had things like um, um, uh, broad bordered bee hawk and one or two things like that up there during the day, along with more common uh, things like um, common heath and, um, and the like. <clears throat> um, also growing in the woodlands up here, you, you, get, the, um, you get the lesser butter, uh, the um, uh, narrow leaved helleborine as well. The sword leaf to Leverine. For me, um, one of the most attractive orchids in this part of the world is Spitzel's orchid. There's not many orchids with green sepals inside of which you get pink dots, um, which is extremely attractive and a very, very, quite a long labellum as well. Um, but it's quite a restricted species in. Um, in Europe, it's known in this part of the world. There are one or two sites um, in, in Italy, um, and then you have to move up to Sweden to see it again. Um, it, it's quite restricted in its distribution, um, but a very attractive plant. And uh, we know where there's a good colony of these. So um, it's one that people often put on their, their tick list. Um, are we going to see Spitzel's orchid, uh, Orchis spitzelii? And, um, Hopefully, if it's out and flowering, we will uh, we will actually find it. So um, we have to hope it's sort of a, a reasonably uh, early season. In the summer, um, perhaps one of the uh, the highlights of uh, of uh, any orchid um, photographer's collection would be ghost orchid, um, Epipodium aphyllum. Um, there's quite a Good colony uh, in the Vercor in July. Um, we, uh, I think, in all the years we've been doing the summer trip, which I think now is thirteen, uh, we've only failed to find it on one occasion. Um, all right, it may only have been one plant or one spike, but um, we've always found some. Um, but uh, it's uh, much, much um, restricted in the British Isles now. Um, I think the last time it was seen was two thousand and eleven. And that was after the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland had announced it was, quote, probably extinct. Its sense of humour then was such to appear. And uh, that's exactly what it did. But it's not been back since, so, you know, whether it comes or not. You need very, very wet springs for this particular saprophyte to, to flower. And uh, I guess several feet of snow provides quite a lot of spring wet for it. Onto the butterfly side, in the uh, we do get things. One or two of the more unusual things in Britain, like checkered skipper, um, we certainly uh, certainly see that fairly frequently. Natweed fertility is fairly common um, again across the season. Uh, several broods. <coughs> Baton blue is quite a rarity. We've only ever had it on three occasions, and always down at the lower altitudes. Very tiny, very attractive little but little blue butterfly, um, and um, but we've been lucky enough to have it, as I said, on about three occasions. Clouded Apollo, I think um, Mike might have mentioned this um, um, when he was uh, doing his talk. Uh, sorry, David, and uh, it says we were very fortunate. The year I took this photograph, we drove over a high pass on our way down to the lower side of the uh, Burkhor Plateau. And we stopped to look at the views and to uh, watch some marmots. And we suddenly realized that it was the morning that these guys were hatching. There were hundreds of them um, taking to the air, drying out, coming out of chrysalises, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was just very, very fortunate, um, but uh, an amazing, amazing sight um, to, to witness. The ordinary Apollo is very common here. 
and subalpine grassland is, uh, is its love. And, uh, we've certainly, we certainly get to see quite a few of these. Black vein white, again, tends to be at the lower altitudes, um, but uh, now sadly no longer in the British Isles, but um, used to be in Kent um, uh, up until early Victorian times, I think. Um, but it's, uh, it may well be one of those that returns with uh, climate change. It may well be one that comes back. <clears throat> uh, this was an ex particularly exciting find for me um, when, when we, we discovered this little beast. I knew instantly what it was because um, a couple of years before, Alan Miller had rung me up uh, at home when he was doing the butterfly trip in the pyramid, in the um, uh, Dolomites and said to me, what's this flower on his on a photograph that he'd also sent to me by email. And uh, so I looked at it, I said, oh, that's cross gentian, um, gentiana cruciata. And he said, oh, that's good. We made that mountain elk on blue laying its eggs on it. It's its, it's its food plant. And this one I found in a meadow with the only two or three plants of, mount, of um, cross gentian that I know of in the, uh, in the Vercor with its resident Alcon blue female laying eggs, which is absolutely amazing. And most of the, it's a, it was a first in that part of the world for me. And talking to the local expert, he said, uh, it's not seen very often. I guess you have to stake out your cross gentian. Revadin's blue, uh, <clears throat> another one of the ones with silver studs, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that one is um, infrequent in the spring, although it does occur, but in the summer, there are one or two nice grassy banks which can have quite a few flying on it. Um, so that, that's quite an exciting one to see. The moths in the summer, we do a moth trap. Um, and if, um, if, it, if the weather is warm enough, our hotel in La Chapelle is at um, 1200 meters. So it can be chilly first thing in the morning. Uh, if it's warm enough overnight, I'll, I'll, I'll try a moth trap during the, sun, the spring trips as well. And, um, but during the, uh, the, uh, the uh, July trip, we, we certainly get things like July high flyer, scarce silver lines, uh, small elephant hawk, et cetera, et cetera. We've had things like um, goat moth and, um, and uh, nice things like that. Um, of course, already referred to on, in one of the talks this evening is the, uh, is the Nature Trek picnic. Um, this one was set up by myself and uh, um, Laura Benito and uh, ready for the folks to uh, demolish. Um, and it's uh, one of the things, as I said, we always use the cheese of the Vercor because it's available and we're in the right place. So using local produce is always good. Same with the meat and, uh, and the bread is all local. Okay, just to tidy up, um, you're looking there at Montigui or Needle Mountain, uh, which is on the um, uh, on the east side of the Vercor Plateau. We don't actually see that in the spring trips because we don't get round that far. But as you can see from here, we do um, one uh, trip in uh, May, which goes by train. Uh, you take Eurostar from St Pancras down to Lille, Europe. And then we go from Lille, Europe on the, uh, the TGV down to Lyon, and then pick up our mini buses and drive down. Uh, spring by air, we fly to uh, Lyon, as I explained to you before, uh, there and back, either British Airways or um, uh, EasyJet. The summer, again, is by air, and uh, the butterflies is also by air. However, I would say if you are someone who prefers to limit or restrict your air travel, uh, that it, is, it is perfectly possible to get to um, uh, this area by train um, if you wish to join one of the uh, air by air options, but you can, you can also do it by train. Anyway, thank you all for listening. Um, I, I hope you'll, you, you will uh, think about joining us here. It's a lovely part of the world. And Andy and I remember when we first went there, it was very quiet. There weren't huge numbers of people. There still aren't. It's a very secret place. Thanks a lot.
Thank you very much, Paul. That was fantastic. And Mike, if you're ready to uh, start with your presentation, then yep. that'd be great. And over to you. Thanks, Thank Paul. You. And over Shall to you, Mike. Is that working? No, not yet. You need to uh, click the green share screen button. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hang on a sec. All these fiddly bits of technology. I know, I'm, ru I'm running ahead of myself. Uh, okay, where are we? That one there. Okay, is that good? Yeah, and then if you just play it from the beginning, that's it. You got it. How's that? Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I can't hear you, but I can tell you're out there. Um, so, uh, yeah, it is rather strange just basically sat at home talking to yourself, but um, my wife has sensibly hived off into the other room so she doesn't have to listen to me going on. Um, so uh, I'm talking a little bit about Corsica, which is known as the Scented Isle for good reason, because it's just absolutely awash with wonderful herbs and many other plants. Um, and uh, so you're probably hoping that you're going to get a slightly different talk. But uh, one of the things about um, Corsica is that uh, it's actually the most mountainous. Um, uh, it's actually uh, the most mountainous. Sorry, I'm just I'm just resetting the screen because I can't see what I need to see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it's the most mountainous of the Mediterranean islands. Um, it's the fourth largest of the Mediterranean islands. And uh, in the map that you can hope to see at the moment, uh, you can see its position. It uh, currently belongs to France. It belonged to Italy in the past. It's had uh, certain elements of freedom at various times. And it's a very, um, it's a, a, a nation steeped in a lot of history. It's the island where Napoleon Bonaparte was born um, and a very proud uh, nation of people. Um, it's quite a large island. Um, certainly by Mediterranean standards, 114 miles long by about 52 miles wide um, and uh, over 600 miles of coastline with more than 200 beaches. Um, so it's not just mountainous, it's got everything from sea level um, right the way up. Um, a, a quick look at a couple of maps from the flora for the island just give a rough idea of um, just how mountainous it is. The picture on the left um, is showing um, the main sort of mountain core. You can see the, the little um, key at the top with the darker areas being the higher altitude. So running down the middle of the island is a, a granite core, which constitutes the bulk of the island with some schists over on the east side. And then actually a small area down around Bonifacio in the south of, of limestone, which um, we don't really get a chance to get down to because a lot of the, the uh, endemic plants and other things that people want to see tend to be up towards the, the northern half of the island. Uh, there are, uh, the central core is over 2000 meters in height. Um, and there's about 120 summits that are over 2000 meters, which is about six and a half thousand feet. And the highest point is Monte Cinto, which is 8,800 feet above sea level. So it's, um, it's not just a little, uh, little spit of the island. Um, has quite a range of plant communities, which is what the right hand map shows. Um, the little stars showing the uh, kind of main uh, warm Mediterranean climate areas. And then you get gradually cooler Mediterranean regions. Um, and taking you up through the mount mountains of Alpine and even Alpine zones in the uh, higher areas. Um, so what I thought I'd do was sort of be somewhat logical, hopefully, and um, start from the coast and run you up to the, the higher mountains. And starting at the coast near Bastia is what I would refer to as my kind of beach. Um, there are a lot of very busy beaches in Corsica, but there are still some amazing beaches for wildlife. Um, bit of a shame that um, the good old Southern Hemisphere um, hot and tall figs and allies are uh, pretty common in the Mediterranean and are ousting some of the local plants, but um, still a lot of good plants to see. One that a lot of people want to see if they're keen botanists is cottonweed, 
uh, which is still pretty common in some parts of the Mediterranean, um, but is sadly now extinct in the UK. And I think that's one of the reasons why people want to see it. Um, it is a wonderful plant, it used to be in its own genus, Otanthus, but they moved it into Achillea a short while ago, the same genus as Yarrow, uh, has a little yellow flower a little bit later in the year, um, not quite out of the time that, uh, that we tend to be visiting. Um, another fairly standard kind of Mediterranean fare um, at the coast, but still nice to see. Plants like sea chamomile on the left and three horn stock on the right. Um, other plants such as sea medic, which is just a fabulous little plant, little member of the clover family, like all the medics with trifoliate leaves. But the leaves just wonderfully um, silky hairy with white hairs to protect them from the salty atmosphere. Uh, and on the right, Centauria spherocephala, horrible name. It doesn't have an English name for some reason, so we'll have to think of one for it. Quite common in the Mediterranean on sandy beaches. Um, and as you can probably see, rather spiny, so not ideal uh, for people who are walking barefoot on the sand. Other parts of the island, uh, you tend to find that the rocks come right down to the coast. Um, so there are some cliff areas, but also amazing areas of Mediterranean maquis, this kind of low scrub woodland um, that occurs throughout much of the region is uh, really amazingly common still on uh, Corsica in some places. Uh, and um, one of the ways you can get to some of these areas is simply from the roadsides. There is a good number of pullouts, um, little parking places and uh, viewpoints where you can stop. And there's usually some plants within a short walking distance uh, once you get out of parking place. The parking places, of course, for the botanists are exciting because they're always full of introductions and all sorts of uh, funny little things like that. Um, but some of the plants in these more stony areas rather than the sandy beaches, uh, yellow centauri is very common in some places, uh, closely related to our, our bright pink centauri, but a lovely rich yellow and a member of the gentian family. Um, other plants of interest, scarlet pimpernel, um, of the two flowers there, the red flower is the classic scarlet pimpernel that we all know from home. But here it also comes in variety parviflora, which is this tiny little purplish blue flower. And you can see next to the regular common pimpernel just how small it is. Um, uh, elsewhere where you get uh, rock rose scrub, which is uh, again, pretty common on, uh, on Corsica, quite a few numbers of species there. You get these amazing little plants called Cytinus, which again, doesn't have an English name, um, but there are two species, um, sometimes been lumped as one, currently split off as two. Um, they're easily told by their color. There's Cytinus ruber, which is this one with the white flowers. They both have the red um, bracts around the outside of the flowers. Um, and this one has the white flowers in the middle um, that one tends to occur on uh, pink flowered cistus, and I should mention that these are actually parasites that grow on the roots of the cistus or rock rose bushes. Um, so they, uh, all you ever see are these flowers with the colourful bracts, you don't see any leaves, they're getting all of their sustenance by tapping into the underground parts of the rock rose bushes. Um, the other one which also occurs on the island is Cytinus hypocystis. Um, which usually occurs on the white flower cistus, and um, it has the same red bracts around the outside, but the flowers are fully open on this one, and they're, they're yellow and hiding the red bracts. Uh, as soon as you move away from the beaches, there are areas of lower lying ground which have been cultivated, uh, amazingly full of flowers, lots of gladioli, sorry, gladioli of several species, um, this one's Gladiolus dubius, often called the Southern Italian Gladiolus. Um, and, and a lot of kind of spiky things, really, because there's this lovely yellow Bartzia, um, which is a hemiparasite. Um, it, it's semi-parasitic on a number of other plant species, has green stems and green leaves, so it's capable of photosynthesizing, but it's still getting a lot of goodness by tapping into the roots of other plants around it. Um, rather like the yellow rattle does in our hay meadows in the UK. In fact, they're in the same family and also in the same family as the, uh, the, the yellow Bartzia there is the Bellardia, uh, which is closely related and has these pink and white flowers. Um, 
as we move a little further inland, we get into kind of the hinterland, um, still in the lowlands, but we're starting to get rolling hills. And that's very much a feature of Corsica, which is a, an island that has barely a straight road on it. So um, it's certainly a, an interesting place for a, a switchback ride. Um, lots of uh, lots of nice views out the window and eventful drives as you travel around the island. Um, this is actually an area called the Lower Asco Valley, um, which is one of the valleys that leads right up um, under the, the uh, eye of Monte Cinto, the highest point, um, and leads up into the, uh, the upper parts of the northern part of the island. Um, and just wonderful, wonderful views wherever you stop. Terracotta roofs, classic Mediterranean, and a kind of a, a strange sort of feeling of, am I in France or am I in Italy? You, you get a little bit of both here. And um, it just has a feeling of both countries, really. Um, just spectacular place. Um, again, in the lower Asco Valley, you soon start to get in regions where the flowers just start to predominate. Uh, the whole of this part of the island in this kind of hinterland just back from the beaches is kind of a patchwork of evergreen oaks, cork oak, um, and these lovely hay meadows uh, with lots of flowers at the time that we visit. Um, and some of the plants you get now, we're starting to get a little bit higher up. And it's really in the higher areas where you start to get the, uh, the endemic plants. The beaches tend to be pretty much the same as anywhere else in the Mediterranean. But as you get higher, that's where you start to get the plants that are uh, very specific to the, to the region. Um, so a, a few here, um, Tucrian marum, which is a regional endemic in the central Mediterranean area. Um, never quite in flower when we're there, but has has these lovely kind of glutinous leaves. Um, and then the sticky one itself, sticky woundwort. Um, this one is a, very much a local endemic found on Corsica, Sardinia, and the little island of Capri off the, the west coast of, uh, of Italy. So this is what's known as the Tyrrhenian region, which is a word you'll often hear mentioned with some of the species in Corsica. Um, and then one that some people may know from home, Corsican mint, Mentha requinii because it's quite popular as a as an alpine or garden plant, very low creeping plant, the smallest of the mints with flowers that are just a couple of millimeters across. So you have to get down on your hands and knees to really appreciate that one. Uh, also on kind of grassy sides of the road and little banks, Illyrian sea daffodil, which is um, endemic to the Tyrrhenian region. Um, it, a lot of people will know the common sea daffodil, which is um, like a white flowered daffodil that grows on sandy beaches around the Mediterranean. Um, it, uh, it flowers in the autumn, um, but the Illyrian sea daffodil flowers earlier in the year in May. So it's a plant that can be seen when we we're doing regular um, botanical and general natural history trips to the island. Uh, it is a truly spectacular plant, lovely thing. Um, and then spectacular for a different reason and not particularly lovely is um, this arum, um, which has the hideous name of Helicodiceros muscivorus, um, has a variety of um, not particularly flattering English names. Um, and it has a, a kind of a special trick up its sleeve, which is mirrored by some of the other members of the arum family. It's designed to not only look like a piece of dead meat in that it's pinkish in colour um, with a rather inviting dark centre to investigate. Um, and it's got this kind of hairiness to it as well, which is quite distinctive. And you might notice in the photograph, there are several flies on the flower. And that's what this plant is doing. It's attracting the flies, not only by looking like a piece of dead meat, but actually by smelling like one as well. So it is really quite a, a bizarre plant and, and well worth seeing. It's endemic to Corsica, Sardinia and some of the Balearic Islands. Um, some of you may have seen it on the Menorca trip, which is quite a famous place for it, where uh, Lilford's wall lizard hangs out on the flowers, eating the flies that, uh, that get drawn in. Um, getting a little bit higher still, um, getting above places like Vivario in the centre of the island, you start to get uh, more forested areas and definitely much more rugged, uh, more granite round. Um, and again, still truly spectacular views. Uh, snow on the high peaks, even during early summer. Um, and wonderful uh, streams. This is the Restonica Valley near Corte, which is a, 
a regular place to visit and sometimes to stop. Um, the streams have grey wagtails and dippers on them. Uh, so always plenty to see along them, always plenty of, uh, of, of good wildlife around. Um, and even some scenes that might seem strangely familiar, because this is the home, of course, of Corsican pine, which is a subspecies of the black pine. Um, and it's, it's found on Corsica, it's the dominant tree um, at higher altitudes, but also a favourite tree for the Forestry Commission in the UK. Um, and many of you will have seen it uh, all over the UK where it's planted for forestry purposes. And if you've been to my neck of the woods to Thetford Forest or up to Holcombe Dunes on the Norfolk coast, uh, you'll have certainly seen these plants there. Um, but as this is Corsica, the Corsican pines have some nice plants under them, some familiar, not so much. So um, the first one probably very familiar to gardeners is Corsican hellebore, which is very popular as a garden plant. But here it's uh, growing as a native wild plant on the sides of the roads as you drive up through the, through the woods. Um, Corsican saxifrage, um, which is a little bit more widespread than its name suggests. It's also found in the Balearics and Sardinia and actually in mainland Spain as well, um, where quite a chunk of its habitat is. So sometimes these plants are named after where they're first found and then people discover that they're, uh, they're also found elsewhere. Um, another one that may seem somewhat familiar is spring sowbread, Sycamore and Rapandum. Uh, many sycamores grown as garden plants. This one is, is very, very common on Corsica and it's quite widespread in the Mediterranean region, but always nice to see it carpeting the ground beside the roads. Um, and then another one that can sometimes flower very early in the year, January, February time in the lowlands, um, but much later higher up, this is Friar's Cow, which is often flowering um, uh, sort of two thirds of the way up in the higher woodland areas. Um, by the time of our usual visits there. These areas also have a lot of bulbs, um, many, many bulb species up here, which is their way of surviving the drier parts of the year, of course, during the summer. Pendulous garlic, Allium pendulinum, is a lovely little thing. Uh, Left-hand picture shows you what it looks like when it's in full flower, um, like many of the other little alliums. But then as the flowers go over and the seed pods start to form, they, they turn into the picture on the right where the flowers actually arch over and they create this kind of pendulous or weeping look to the flowers. Another little plant that can be very common in uh, certain places under the pine trees is Brumura fastigiata, which is a little tiny white flower, um, probably belying it a little bit by getting in close with the camera, but this really is a, a tiny little flower and can occur in quite, uh, quite good numbers, quite nice sheets of plants under the trees. That's a plant that's endemic to Corsica, Sardinia and the Balearics, like so many here. Uh, moving up to greater heights, uh, places like the upper Restonica Valley and some of the other passes get you up to the very top of the tree line and even beyond. Um, and now you really start to get that same appearance that you get in the Alps or the Pyrenees. You really are high up here, um, as I say, well over 6,000 feet. Um, and uh, really starting to get into proper alpine plants, which is often a surprise to people given that they thought they were on a Mediterranean island. And of course they are, but, uh, but really quite amazing. And you get these wonderful, what you might call granny pines, these very old Corsican pines, which adopt a very different shape to the ones lower down. And you might just notice on the ground underneath the little green carpets there is the, uh, the creeping common juniper that occurs up here. Up here too, there are bulbs coming out in the spring, um, Gagea solirolii, uh, quite widespread in the Western Mediterranean, but good colonies of it up here. And then one that's a, a really nice endemic only found on Corsica and Sardinia, and that is the Corsican crocus. And there are some really nice sheets of those as well um, at altitude above the tree line. And one of the great things with these mountain areas is if it's a warmer or colder, uh, year and the season may be advanced or retarded, you just go a little bit higher, a little bit lower, and these plants occur at, at quite a range of altitude. So typically when you visit, you can find somewhere where you can find these plants in flower, regardless of uh, what the season has been like. Um, orchids seem to be popular for some reason, so I thought I should uh, mention some at least. 
pink butterfly orchid, a, a widespread Mediterranean species, but always amazing to see. Um, and there really are some very big colonies. I've seen uh, stands of hundreds of plants of these on roadsides in parts of Corsica. Um, Barton's orchid, uh, one of the dactylorizers, one of the marsh orchids, this lovely rich, rich yellow flower with little red spots in the center. Um, very similar to Provence orchid, but without the spotty leaves. Um, and then the Serapius, the tongue orchids, of which there are plenty on Corsica. This one I particularly like, it's one of the larger, broader petaled ones, which is called heart-lipped tongue orchid, um, which is really quite an amazing uh, plant to see. Um, I'll just move on away from flowers because we've got a very flowery day today. Uh, just mentioned a few other bits and pieces that are there. There are other endemics and near endemics to be found in the other groups of, of wildlife. Um, Corsican dappled white, which is found on Corsica and Sardinia, is a spectacular little butterfly when you see it up close. Very similar to our female orange tip um, with a, a black tip to the wings on the upper side, but this amazing dappled pattern underneath. And um, this one I realize not the sharpest picture I've got, but it's the only one I've got of uh, Corsican war brown, uh, which was recently split from our war brown. As you can see here, much more orange with very fine dark lines on it instead of the broader lines that our war brown has. Dragonflies and damselfly enthusiasts, there's a few things for you as well. Um, migrant spread wing or, mig or uh, migrant emerald. On the uh, left-hand side, Lestes barbarous, um, which people get excited about because these things are beginning to turn up in Northern Europe now. Um, and uh, the right-hand one, the pair there is island blue tail, which is very similar to our common blue tail, a little tiny dragonfly with a neon blue uh, spot on the towards the tail tip. Um, and uh, this one endemic to just a few islands in the Western Mediterranean. Also things with four legs and that run around the place. Um, Italian war lizard, central Mediterranean speciality, but one that's actually been introduced a few places around Europe, including in the UK. But it's nice to see them where they belong in their home. Really nice uh, stripy lizards, nice and approachable. Uh, that lovely rich moss green stripe down the middle of the back, which is always a good feature. Uh, one of the must-sees, but uh, sadly rather difficult to find, and this was actually the only time I've ever seen it, is Pygmy algaroides, which is a, a tiny lizard with very strongly um, ridged scales, uh, which gives it a very spiky look. Um, and This is endemic to Corsica and Sardinia. Um, and somewhat bizarrely, we found this one when we stopped at a petrol station just to fill the vehicles up. So you never know where you're going to find things. Um, and the third lizard I've put up is uh, Tyrrhenian wall lizard, which is the most spectacular and most colourful of the, the lizards. Um, this one is also endemic to Corsica and Sardinia. Um, and when you get up to altitude, you get Bedriaga's rock lizard, which is a big chunky one that uh, lives very high up uh, towards the upper edge of the tree line, mostly. Um, covering a few birds, just uh, to more or less finish off. Um, because we've got that great range of altitude from uh, from sea level right the way up, you can get a nice range of birds here, including some somewhat generic uh, Mediterranean species, but still nice to see. Outer winds gulls, usually a few hanging around um, the big lake near um, Big Uglia. Um, other birds such as blue rock thrushes are scattered throughout the islands where it's uh, a, a nice warmer climate for them. Um, and migration time, there are all sorts of things passing through. Red-footed falcons are actually quite frequent and can be quite approachable when they're on migration. Um, so they're always good birds to look for in the lowlands. Again, like the plants, when you move up into the uh, higher ground, you get uh, more of the endemics. Um, a time was there was just one endemic to go to Corsica for, which was the little Corsica nuthatch, um, which can be tricky to see. Easy to pick up by core, but not always easy to see. And uh, as you can probably see here, I haven't always got the best of photos of it because um, they're pretty hyperactive and often in the shade. But you usually do get really good views of them when you see them, even if the camera can't pick them out very well. Um, but the taxonomists have done us a few favours now. So we now have Corsican finch, which has been split from citral finch um, and is 
best distinguished by that brown back that it has to it. It's actually rather common on Corsica and not too difficult to find. Uh, you can find them eating seeds in the flowery meadows. Um, and other birds that are sort of coming our way, Marmora's warbler, uh, we split into Marmora's and um, Balearic warbler. Uh, Marmora's is the one that uh, you will still find on Corsica, um, but now much rarer on a world scale because Marmora's is confined to Corsica, Sardinia and some little islets around uh, Italy, Capri and um, some of the other Ligurian islands. Um, Maltoni's warbler uh, is a species that was split from subalpine warbler. It is quite distinctive. It has a funny kind of a, a, a pinkish color underneath rather than richer orangey or rusty tones of the other forms of subalpine warbler. Um, very distinctive calls as well. Um, and uh, quite plentiful on Corsica in the right places. Uh, another bird, which again, uh, we can thank the taxonomist for is Mediterranean flycatcher. Uh, which is endemic to the Balearics, Corsica and Sardinia, who split from spotted flycatcher, is a paler looking bird, to my eyes often more rotund, more like the shape of a pied flycatcher, and uh, very poorly marked, very pale underneath with the streaks on the chest really being kind of smudgy marks rather than finely delineated lines. Um, uh, Woodchat Shrike is uh, one that's kind of been waiting because there's an endemic subspecies um, uh, in these same little islands, the Balearics, Corsica and Sardinia um, of Woodchat Shrike, which doesn't have a white patch in the wing like the uh, forms found elsewhere. So maybe one day someone will decide it's uh, worth turning into another species. Um, and uh, finally, in this little group, Italian Sparrow, which people have... Uh, had a tug of war over for many years, appears to be a hybrid between Spanish sparrow and house sparrow, but the taxonomists now consider that um, it's been separated long enough that uh, we really ought to consider it uh, a good species. So that's a good bird to see. Um, it does have that look of a hybrid of a Spanish and a, uh, and a house sparrow with that lovely rich chestnut crown, a little bit of gray showing in the center there. But they're, um, they're, they're just like any sparrow. They're chirpy and, and friendly in some of the towns that we sometimes stop at. So uh, you do get a chance to look at those. Um, so that's very much a whirlwind uh, sweep through Corsica from, uh, from coast up to the mountains and back down again. Uh, so hopefully there's something there to, to tempt you. Um, and if there isn't, then I'll just leave you with another bird that uh, can be very common. And this one was actually photographed out of the van window just to give an idea of what good looks you get. So European bees is on migration uh, near Biguglia. And uh, I think that's me done for now. That's great. Thanks so much, Mike. It was a great talk. And thanks very much, Paul. Mike, that Trinian wall lizard was uh, just stunning. I really enjoyed seeing the pictures are, of all those. Yeah, really good. They are amazing, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, okay, so we've got a few questions coming in. Folks, please do feel free just to type questions in the Q&A section. Um, Mike, you're still sharing your screen. Yes. Um, I'm there we go, I got rid of that. Still familiarising myself with the buttons. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got a question for you, Mike, uh, from Alan Woodward. Hi, Alan. Um, and he's asking about uh, bird migration and whether you see birds migrating in Corsica and how does it compare with the Balearics bird-wise? It's probably very similar to the Balearics. The islands, of course, don't do quite as well as the mainland because birds have got across the sea to get there and the Mediterranean is quite wide in that area. But you do get migration and it can be surprisingly good. Um, I've mentioned bee eaters, um, red-footed falcons go through there in good numbers, but harriers too. Harriers are, are quite happy to cross uh, areas of sea, so harriers will come through. And I've seen some really good passages of honey buzzards through there as well. Um, most of them pass up the east side of the island and, and often we're there times just right to, to pick up birds like that. Um, the very north of the island as well at Cap Course can be very good because a lot of the birds tend to gravitate there before they jump off and head north again. Um, so even birds like red-throated pipit can turn up, regular things like tree pipits, uh, willow warblers, birds like that uh, can be quite frequent. I, I temper that by saying that a lot of trips to Corsica tend to focus on 
the specialities of the region, the endemics, which means we spend a lot of time up in the mountains. You're not going to see much in the way of migration up there. But any time that we're down in the lowlands and we're usually down there a little bit of the time to look at some of the lakes, then, yeah, there's, there's a chance of seeing some migration. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um... And we've got another question from Heather Davies asking if we can just give some information about the accommodation and the food on Corsica. Um, the accommodations are, are veritable, but I don't know if Andy wants to talk about the accommodations that are mostly used. The food, I can tell you, is spectacular. Um, it is France, after all, um, and it has an Italian influence um, and it also has its own independence. Um, they're very, very proud of their conditions. The cheeses are to die for, um, but they can make your eyes water. Um, if you're into blue cheeses and goat's cheeses, then they really are quite amazing. But yeah, food, food is wonderful. It, it's Mediterranean with French and Italian influences. So, so what are you, you know, what are you going to expect? It's great. Yeah, accommodation on the Corsica tour, we use uh, a family-run hotel up in the mountains of the north of the island near Corte with wonderful views out over a valley, uh, a rustic property which probably hasn't been decorated since 1971, but that's part of the kind of charm of going to a backwater like Corsica. Uh, so we spend, I think, three nights there, then four nights down in the central part of Corsica near Venigo, um, at a nice country hotel there. And Corsica is different to the other three tours that the folks have been talking about this evening, and it's two centre, um, the Vercor, Dolomites and French Pyrenees, you've got seven nights all in the same hotel which suits some people who just want to unpack and feel, uh, you know, stable in one base for the, for the whole week. But in Corsica, uh, we want to move around the island and see a, a wider di diversity of habitats. Uh, so that's why we do the two centres there. So nothing flash, you know, you don't get your spas and your, your kind of gold um, ribbed uh, bedside lights, etc. But you do get um, lovely Corsican hospitality and, you um, mountain, you know, traditional mountain food, uh, bags of character, I'd sum up Corsica. Yep. Great, thanks Andy and Mike. Uh, we don't have any other questions. I think we've answered everything. So unless anyone wants to dive in with something last minute, be it a panelist or uh, an attendee, <clears throat> then I think we can close for this evening. Yeah, I just want to say a, a huge thanks to uh, the leaders, to all of you for joining this evening. It's really been a, a pleasure to listen to, to you speaking and, and all of the talks that you've done have just been fantastic. So thank you so much for giving up your time for doing that. A big thank you to all of you. And thank you all so much of you for joining us at home. It's really great to be back. We'd love you to join us next week uh, on Wednesday, the 20th of October, where we'll be focusing on Northern Europe featuring Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Iceland. So we hope you can join us. You can sign up on the homepage on our website. You'll also receive a follow-up link uh, from this evening uh, via email, which will come to you tomorrow. And it'll, that'll contain a link for you to register for future uh, online roadshows. Uh, and if you think that of any more questions after this evening, please don't hesitate to give us a ring in the office or just drop us an email. We're more than happy to chat to you. Um, so it will be goodbye from me. Uh, and others, unless we have any other questions, thank you all for your kind comments that are coming in, saying you've all really enjoyed it. We really appreciate that, folks. Uh, it, we really revel in the feedback that we get because it's nice to know that people enjoy tuning in to listen to us. I've, I've just got one question, Sarah, before we uh, sign off. We've still got nearly 100 households on. Thanks for joining us this evening. Mike, you've just got back from a trip. I don't think, Jessica, Paul and David, you've been abroad, certainly tour leading since... Uh, since um, lockdown was lifted but Mike you've just got back from Mallorca so just for the folks still listening um, and I want you to keep giving up beat answer how did, how did you find <laughs> everything with the paperwork and the testing yeah I, I'm actually glad that uh, that I did it really because I I'd be lying if I didn't say I was apprehensive um, and it's great that people are wanting to travel and of course we're doing the best we can to uh to uh to help there um and, and Mallorca is an easy destination to do um one of the things that was great about it was that um because it's a it, it's a kind of a mainstream tourist resort 
the hotel was fabulous at knowing exactly what we needed to do. There was a there was a of course a little bit more paperwork to do. There seemed at the time to be a little bit of confusion sometimes between uh, the the, um, the the staff at the airport and the and the crews in the planes. Um, we did have a form to fill out which nobody needed to collect in, which was quite entertaining. Um, and but but clearly those are things, and, the, and really the reason I mention them is that those are things that are going to change over time. Uh, everyone's going to become more familiar with how things have changed, at least in the short term. But as as these people whose job it is to help us through these things become more familiar, they're they're going to help us through. And even if we're feeling a little bit overwhelmed or unsure unsure what to do, um, there's going to be someone there to help. Um, and indeed, I did two uh, back-to-back trips, as, as you know, Andy, two one-week trips. And by the time I came back at the end of the second week, things had, had grossly improved since since we went out even just in the two weeks because more people traveling, more people getting to understand what's going on. And probably a lot of it was um, the customers understood as well. The travelers understood a little bit better. So the airline staff weren't quite so exasperated with having to say the same things over and over again. Um, I have to say that um, Andy and Rihanna at the, at the office were great in helping and emails were going backwards and forwards and messages and we we're helping each other, um, making sure that we were all up to date with things if they did change. Um, anybody who's concerned about not having various pieces of equipment like smartphones or apps or anything like, like that, um, we found that that's all accommodated for because you're not alone. There are many people in that situation. Um, we had a few people on, on both the trips that I did um, and we walked them through the procedure. They were able to have uh, printed paper versions of all the various things that they needed um, and, and it was all fine. And of course, things have changed even since then. Um, things have just changed just a few days ago now to make things even easier for us. Uh, we hope, fingers crossed, even easier. Um, and yeah, it was um, it was kind of odd at times, but while we were there, everybody was doing the right thing. Um, everybody was thinking about other people. Um, and and uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no real problems. A few, a few little things, a few little things for us to iron out behind the scenes, but I don't think anything for the for the clients to worry about, um, just just little things to make life a little bit more interesting, let's say. One of our worries was somebody testing positive for COVID before flying home and therefore being stranded mm -hmm. in a foreign country, speaking a foreign language. But as you say, Mike, even since you've come home, things have changed in that, that pre-departure test before flying back to the UK is no longer required. So. Uh, we've got over this potential hurdle now of people being stranded overseas with COVID. Uh, so that's one big step forward. And the other step forward, we're awaiting a government announcement on this, is that the, the day two back at home PCR test is likely to be substituted with uh, a cheaper rapid antigen test. And that should come into play late October, early November. So things are getting easier as time goes on. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um... We did, funny you mentioned it, I mean, prior to Mallorca, I was in Iceland for a week with David Phillips. Um, and just as an example, uh, we had somebody on that trip doing their two days before you go home test, which tested positive. Um, but there can be hiccups in the system. And indeed, the person took a, a, another test shortly afterwards, which proved negative, And we were able to get them booked into a doctor the next day. Uh, full test taken, the test proves negative and everything was fine. Um, so again, just an example of how there's no need to panic. If anything looks like it's going a little bit, uh, a little bit strange, there are people there to help. Um, and th that's part of our job. That's what we're there for. So it's been a big learning curve for us as well. Um, another hat to have to wear when you're, when you're really what you want to be doing is just showing people nice wildlife. But, um, you know, if, if we didn't do that, we'd only go to sleep. So, you know, you've got to do something at night, haven't you? Right. Thanks, Mike. Great. Thanks, Mike. 
And did you have anything to add or are you happy to, to finish now? No, I think I'll go from watching the last five minutes of England hungry if, if we can close down now. <laughs> it sounds like it's getting fairly feisty from what's uh, been flashing up on the news on my phone. So yeah, enjoy. Right, folks, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, we hope to see you next Wednesday. And until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.